Andre is actually quite famous. That he's actually got two Nobel prizes. In that he originally had the Ig Nobel Prize for levitating frogs. You are listening to Service Course by the Cycling Podcast in association with Rafa. The stories behind the bikes. I would say it's this kind of new playground for interesting physical phenomena. So it's got length, it's got breadth, but it's a one atomic layer thick. It's the thinnest possible material. If you take a cable and drop it all the way down to the ground, then you've got a connection between space and the Earth, and you can then just grab hold of this cable and climb up like Jack and the Beanstalk, and then you're in space. With Tom Worley and Lizzie Banks. Where have you brought me today, Lizzie? So, we are at the David Meller Cafe, which is in Hallisage. Um, it's a cutlery factory uh, and also the home of the British traffic light. Yeah, so David Meller, it's not the David Meller that many of you will remember as a, an MP and a famous Chelsea fan. Um, this is David Meller, who was a very, very influential designer, and this is the David Meller Cafe Museum in Hallisage. Um, what's the link to the traffic light? So back in 1965, he was commissioned to redesign all of the British traffic lights, so declutter them, um, create an easy, kind of user-friendly design. Um, That was 4,500 traffic lights that were rolled out across the UK. He also designed some pretty cool bus shelters, so we're kind of set back from the road here, and we've got traffic lights indoors and a bus shelter just outside. Yeah, so the the sort of pretty standard British bus shelter, the the, the one out there is a, a London one, that... You know, you just think that's just a functional shape, but that was something that David Meller designed. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's it's a really nice place to visit, and you can do a factory tour and and visit the cutlery works and um, yeah, see all these amazing things that he makes. So come down. It's nice. I've, I've, I've cycled past here a load of times, and I've I've, I've never 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 popped in. Um, last time we met Lizzie uh, was in Manchester for the Cycling Podcast Live. It was really good, wasn't it? Yeah, it was great. We uh, we saw some of you guys down there, and um, you came and introduced yourself, and we had a lot of fun. So I think the whole tour was great, and obviously we finished on a high in Manchester. <laughs> so yeah, that was really good. Really good evening. You gave away a couple of jerseys as well to, to, to new homes as well, and they've, they've been doing really well, the jerseys. Yeah, absolutely. It was really nice to meet some people and um, had a couple of jerseys I wanted to give away to some people that had some stories and, uh, yeah, some, some worthy recipients, I think. So it was really lovely to meet you, and we had some really great feedback from our hill climbing episode as well. So if you haven't listened to that, then go back and listen to it now. Yeah, that has been going down really, really well, that one. Um, before we go into detail about this week's episode... I wanted to show you this, Lizzie. This is a business card that I picked up during the course of my interviews for this episode. Um, Can you tell me what it says? (laughs) This is ridiculous. Um, Yeah, I mean, I can't describe it, so I'm just going to read it. I mean, it's business card shaped. It's white. But tell me what it says. But I mean, it's just a bit nuts. It says the International Space Elevator Consortium. So, I mean, I really have absolutely no idea what that is. Well, I promise you, by the end of this episode, I am going to link space elevators to cycling innovation. Um, That is my promise to you. This episode, though, is about graphene. What do you know about graphene, Lizzie? Well, I know quite a lot, but only because I knew that we were doing this episode on graphene, so I did my research. But I guess before that, I really... I knew that it was in my tyres, so I ran Vittoria tyres, and they've been using graphene for quite a while now. And I also knew about the sellotape trick from isolating graphene in the first place, but you'll hear about that later on. Um, Well, I wanted to do this episode because, like you, I'm riding graphene tyres currently, and I think a number... Well, I think most pros seem to be riding them, certainly... They are, they've won some very, very big races. But I remember reading, sort of probably about 2016, there's quite a lot of articles in things like Cycling Weekly and all the cycling magazines about this wonder material, graphene, that was going to replace carbon fibre. Actually, it's never going to replace carbon fibre because it is a carbon fibre. It's just an additive. But um, we heard about all these, you know, this, this potential uh, new wonder material that's going to change cycling. And we've got it in our tyres, but we've not really seen this predicted revolution yet. And I wanted to find out why. So over the last few weeks, I've been meeting with a lot of very, very smart people. I'm Adrian Nixon. I'm a chemist by background. And I run a publishing company that publishes a journal called the Nixine Journal, which monitors everything graphene and 2D, more of that later, um, technical and commercial on a monthly basis around the world. I'm Kieran Mullen, and I'm a PhD student at the University of Manchester. 
and I'm studying the physics of 2D materials. James Baker, I'm the CEO of Graphene at Manchester. It's the organisation responsible for taking the wonder discovery graphene from the lab into the marketplace. I went to meet them at the Graphene Engineering Innovation Centre, affectionately known as The Geek. The purpose of the building is to take this discovery graphene from the science, working with industry, into products and applications. Its purpose really is to make things at scale. So not mass scale, but by the kilogram or by the metre squared. So it's got the ability to make the graphene material by the gram, by the kilo. But we don't really want to make that material, we want to buy it from the supply chain. What we really want to do is to take that material and mix it into composites, into batteries, into sensors or inks, or into membranes. What's the purpose of that? We're trying to create these new product families where graphene makes a real difference to that product. Lizzie, I think you would have loved it in The Geek. Your husband would definitely have loved it in The Geek. He would have loved it. We, we were listening to all the clips from all the incredible physicists there and uh, he was like, Lizzie, do you realise how amazing it is that if we could have this superconductivity and blah, blah, blah. I was like, well, no gaps. I, don't, I didn't really realise, but I, I know now. So, yeah, I'm a lot more clued up on graphene than I was and I think, uh, yeah, it's an amazing building in this incredible facility within Manchester. I mean, I'm just surprised they let me in, to be honest. It's like, you know, there's, there's, they let me touch, like, million-pound machines and stuff like that. Um, so James, Adrian and Kieran told me how graphene can be used in a general fashion. It can make carbon fibre composites humongously stronger. It can make batteries longer-lasting and faster charging. It could make desalination membranes to take... Uh, drinking water from salt water. It can make your clothing into wearable technology. It can make things electrically conductive. It can form new skin treatments or bandages. It's incredibly heat resistant. It could sit on the surface of the sun and be quite happy. There, there are lots of searches for high temperature superconductivity, which would have a huge impact if we could create, if, if it would work at room temperature, just in everyday life. That would be amazing. You could have power transmission that's lossless without huge networks of cooling or whatnot. And how it could be used by the cycling industry. So by adding graphene to a resin to make a carbon fibre, you can potentially get the same equivalent strength for less material. So that translates into potential lower cost, but also lighter weight. So weight is often a driver of performance. So if you can add graphene into your carbon fibre frame to reduce weight, you potentially improve the performance without Um, losing any safety or integrity of the structure. Alternatively, maybe you add graphene into the frame to make it stronger so it's actually tougher and less likely to fracture or to damage. The fastest clothing in the world tour. The home of cycling with character. Ride and watch with Ratha in 2019 as they partner EF Education First and Canyon SRAM. So later on, we'll hear from Stuart Abbott at Dassey Bikes. Uh, They've been an early adopter of graphene and they use it in their frames. Stuart speaks a lot about connectivity and creating a bike that can transmit an incredible amount of data. Kieran also spoke to me about this. Graphene could be used in some uh, strain sensing application. I believe in the aerospace industry, there's already research into... um, analyzing the graphene content of a carbon fiber composite to see how much strain has been put on that carbon fiber. I don't know, maybe we could get sort of just real-time feedback from some electrical device on your bike that would tell you strain and stress on, on, on the bike frame at some point in the future. Just turn on an app and determine how stressed your bike is. Anything stand out for you there, Lizzie? That's really interesting. I mean, obviously, we have strain gauges on bikes at the moment, but in the form of power meters. So we have them really in the cranks, perhaps in the pedals, um, even in the rear hub. But, you know, those don't really show you anything other than your power. But what about if we had it in the frame? You know, you crash on your frame and you think, oh, you know, is it okay? Isn't it okay? And I've had this in the past where I've crashed on a frame and you're not sure if there's a crack or something. But, you know, what if we had a strain gauge and we could say, Oh, it's fine. It's not fine. Um, perhaps it allows you to, to have a longer life cycle of bikes because you're not getting rid of something that's really perfectly fine. 
Yeah, it's interesting. I think we all we've seen. Remember, twenty seventeen, I think it was Tirreno Adriatico when uh, it was Team Sky at the time. I think it was three riders had their wheels fail in, in the TTT at the same time. Now, obviously, that was, there was a reason for that a, a bad, bad batch of wheels. But um, imagine a strain gauge, you know, because you you were at the mercy. You know, you're you're riding as a pro. You're hurtling down mountains at incredible speeds. You have got no idea really what's going on with your bike. You just have to go on trust, right? Yeah, absolutely. And crashes do happen a lot in professional cycling. You know, bikes are travelling around all the time. They're getting thrown from pillar to post and and we don't change them. So if we were able to predict these things and and then prevent crashes, like for instance the one in Torino Adriatico, that could be huge for riders. So all this is pretty hypothetical at the moment, but potentially there's a lot to get excited about. This is something that I think would fundamentally change cycling. So one of the challenges you have on roads today is they need to be very tough. But because of the UK temperature going from quite hot through to very cold, they've got to be able to expand and contract. And if you make a road very tough and brittle, when the temperature changes, it creates cracks, which then if it freezes, you get water in there and you end up with potholes. And we all know what happens in the winter. The UK is full of roads with potholes. The wonderful thing about graphene is we believe we can add that to bitumen. We can make actually the surface tougher, but we can also make it um, expandable and contracting so that when the temperature changes, it doesn't create the cracks, doesn't create the potholes. So the potential for graphene into roads is to get longer lasting, tougher roads. We can maybe also get them even grippier, maybe reduce rolling resistance to reduce fuel. And if I really get excited in the future, we could also build in sensors or charging stations so we can have smart roads that would also be able to charge your vehicle in the future. Lizzie, a world without potholes. Oh, can you imagine how good that would be? You know, it's funny because when I ride around on my home roads, I know exactly where every pothole is. And yesterday I was riding from, from Morven in Worcestershire up to Sheffield, so... It was a long way. A lot of it I didn't know. Malvern to Shefford, that is a blooming long way. <laughs> yeah, it was 190k. Not something I do very often. But it was really fun. But actually something that really annoyed me was not knowing where the potholes were. And there are so many potholes because it's winter at the moment. You know, there's been a lot of floods. If we could prevent that, that would be incredible. And you said something to me very interesting before we started recording. A friend of yours who works for the NHS in the ICU... Yeah, so my friend works in ICU, she's a nurse in ICU at the Northern General in in Sheffield and um, you know, a couple of winters ago we were talking about cycling and she said, you know, the number of cyclists I have seen come through my doors this winter because they've been out on the roads, they've hit a pothole in the dark and they've gone over the handlebars and had a head injury and so preventing potholes isn't just about kind of reducing annoyance for cyclists and cars it's about um, saving money in the economy for road maintenance for healthcare, for rehab in you know people's personal injury as well is a huge range of things that it affects rather than just oh for goodness sake there's another pothole make it happen now please um right we should probably re- rewind a little bit here so i want to go back to how graphene was first isolated and to do that we have to go here great ships of commerce converge on england to manchester bringing to this country to lancashire the raw material of a great industry cotton this is the place in the northwest of England, it's ace, it's the best, and the songs that we sing from the stands from our band set the whole planet shaking. Compromise? Yeah. Does this mean you haven't got a clue about doing away. What does it mean then? It means like. It doesn't, it doesn't mean. It means backing up. That's reverse. Our inventions are legends. There's now we can't make. Every single cotton, everything. Every town had mills, mills, and mills. And so we make brilliant music, we make brilliant bands, we make goals that make souls leap from seats in the stands. It was actually predicted in 1947, um, the actual properties um, of what graphene may be like, as uh, someone was investigating the properties of graphite and... In their theory, they simplified to how the single layers of graphite interact with each other. And so they were considering single layers of carbon, which is graphene. Okay, so 1947 is when graphene is discovered. But now let's fast forward 
to 2004. Good evening. The BBC has been thrown into turmoil by the damning verdict of Lord Hutton on its editorial standards, its management and its board of governors. The Hutton report into the death of the weapons expert, Dr David Kelly, cleared Mr Blair and the government of any blame. So graphene was actually discovered by curiosity. The two scientists in the lab 2004, driven by curiosity in Manchester, even today they have what's called Friday afternoon experiments, fun Fridays. We're not driven by any scientific reason or any commercial reason to have a little bit of free time to actually experiment, to try out ideas. And it was actually two, two physicists looking around some experimentation, actually took some sticky tape, scotch tape out the bin, had some graphite they'd been playing with. They played with that a little bit. They looked under a microscope and they discovered this, this almost transparent flake of material. It was only afterwards when they measured it that they'd actually isolated this single atomic layer of carbon that previously was assumed not to be able to exist because it wasn't stable enough to exist. They then measured it, they found some of these superlative properties and then the Nobel Prize were received in 2010. Quite surprising that sellotape was fundamental in the discovery of graphene. What surprised me in that clip is how they said they got it out of the bin. <laughs> what was it doing in the bin? <laughs> So the two scientists who first isolated graphene were both Russian scientists, um, Professor Andrei Geim and Professor Kostya Novosolov. And they say they were working here in the physics lab at the University of Manchester. Andrei is actually quite famous that he's actually got two Nobel Prizes in that he originally had the Ig Nobel Prize for levitating frogs uh, prior to graphene. Well, I need to uh, bring this back to cycling in a bit, but I can't leave levitating frogs just hanging there. Excuse the pun. I'm afraid I don't know too much around that, but again, it was driven by curiosity and fun. Um, and, you know, uh, Andre's quite famous around the university, not just for his science, but for his sponsorship of science and students and trying to make the whole science, you know, exciting and fun. You know, he's one of the key sponsors of what we call the Centre for Doctoral Training Students. That's so trying to make students not just do great science, but also think about you know, businesses, commercialisation, as well as doing some fun things like making frogs levitate. So that's how graphene was discovered and isolated. But here's the science bit. What actually is it? Graphene is a single layer of carbon and the atoms are arranged in this honeycomb lattice. Basically, it's the building block of graphite. So Graphite is simply lots of layers of graphene stacked on top of each other. So it's got length, it's got breadth, but it's a one atomic layer thick. It's the thinnest possible material. What makes it special as 2D, two-dimensional, it has unique and different properties than that that exists as three-dimensional. So people talk about the superlatives like stronger than steel, firmly electrically conductive, act as a membrane, stretchable, transparent. Think of a ping pong ball in your hand and you have four bonds which are separated out in three dimensions around so you have like um, a stool of three bonds at the bottom with one sticking up that's what diamonds like and all those bonds are the same now they, they lock together in a three-dimensional structure to make a scaffold which is incredibly strong and that's what gives diamonds its properties graphene one of those bonds appears to be missing so if you can imagine that ping pong ball now take one of those bonds off for a minute and then squash it on the floor those three legs of the stool will uh, splay out and you've got like uh, like a flat structure now with every carbon atom connected up to three others and that's what makes that hexagon chicken wire mesh so what's happened to that other bond well that's now sticking up and down below the plane of the, the carbon atom it's a slightly weird sort of a bond because when it connects up with the other carbon atoms in a ring, this bond above the plane of the rings merges with the others and it forms like an, uh, a cloud. Now bonds, as your science re uh, listeners will know, are made of electrons. So that's really all they are, just shared electrons. So this bond that's above the plane of the ring now is uh, fu full of electrons. It creates a sea of electrons. It goes right across the whole molecule. This whole. So can you imagine the chicken wire flat now You've got these incredibly strong bonds in the plane of the chicken wire, which is what gives graphene its strength. But then you've got these what are called delocalized electrons running around, and that's what makes it, the whole of uh, the sheet of graphene incredibly electrically conductive. If we take two layers of graphene, like the normal way you'd find it is interesting in itself, what we would call bilayer graphene. 
but you can actually create completely different properties um, such as unconventional superconductivity which is really interesting to uh, a lot of physicists by simply twisting those two layers at a small angle uh, there's these so-called magic angles so it's really amazing that you've got this ability to stack layers and also twist layers and you can basically like let your mind wander and just come up with new interesting materials that might have i mean you've got to search for it but they might have amazing properties i would say it's this kind of new playground for interesting physical phenomena lizzie i've got to be honest now this is uh, going way over my head are you still with it i'm not surprised tom i'm, I'm just about hanging on but <laughs> but bear with us we're coming back to cycling shortly so are we all going to be riding graphene bikes in the future i think it's a possibility we'll see where companies like dassey go with it um yeah, I, I guess it's just a commercial. Does it make it lighter and stiffer enough for the price it costs to put in? And yeah, with the boom in kind of graphene industries, I expect the price will decrease. So hopefully. As a general statement first, graphene's still relatively young as a new material. So we haven't got all the answers for all the sectors. However, following history, sporting sectors often lead new materials and new innovations. And you've seen that a little bit in cycling. So some of the early adopters of graphene have been in the tyres, have been in some of the bikes on light weighting. So you're already seeing a number of the bike companies starting to engage. Some of them are leading, others have been waiting and watching. I think what you're now seeing from the successful ones, people are now looking at that and thinking, gosh, maybe we should do something. So you're starting to see an increasing pace of companies wanting to engage, not just in the bikes, but in the tyres and in the clothing, for example, that the cyclists may wear, or even in the protective um, helmets and, and uh, devices that people have who ride the bikes. Shoot, uh, shoot à l'arrière du peloton, cycling podcast team car, the back of the pack, please. That's the voice of Seb PK interrupting Lizzie and Tom to remind me to tell you that this month's episode of Service Course is supported by you, the friends of the cycling podcast. We've just launched our 2020 Friends program and episode one, the stage that didn't end, which is all about stage 19 of the Tour de France, is now out. Episode two, a mashup of our recent live shows, is imminent. For just £15, you can get access to all our Friends episodes. We will deliver at least 15 exclusive shows over the next 12 months. And we have a new operating system, which means it's never been easier to sign up and get the latest episodes through your favourite app. For £50, you can become a good friend and we'll send you a signed copy of our book, The Grand Tour Diaries, as a thank you. And for £100, you can become a best friend. We'll send you a signed copy of the book and you'll also have the chance to submit ideas and guest edit an episode. You can also give somebody the gift of a friend of the podcast subscription. See thecyclingpodcast.com for details. The friends of The Cycling Podcast are our biggest supporters. They help us keep the regular episodes free, to cover the grand tours with daily coverage, and to produce our monthly shows, The Cycling Podcast Femina, Service Course, and Explore, which will return in 2020. So if you enjoy The Cycling Podcast, please do sign up at thecyclingpodcast.com forward slash subscribe. Well, you heard Kieran mention Dassey just then. They've been one of the early adopters of the material in terms of cycling. And I spoke to Stuart Abbott, the founder of the company. Stuart began his career working in aviation for Rolls-Royce and then ended up in some more IT-based roles before kind of accidentally starting a bike brand. I used to swim at a UK level and, and, and I decided when I sort of got into my 40s that I was considerably unfit. I got myself a personal trainer and I started training what was initially a couple times a week, then it turned out to be four or five times a week. And on one session, I went to um, the guy who said, right, I've signed you up for a, for a race. And I thought, oh, right, yes, we're probably going to be doing a 5K run around Hartley Whitney or something like that. But no, he'd signed me up to the Abu Dhabi Half Ironman. And that's where Dassey actually started. Because at that point, rather than being... I don't know, really, uh, best to describe it as an ordinary individual. I thought, well, I'm looking around at buying a bike. I think I could probably do a better job of this. It's not that complicated. And so I bought six frames from around the world. I cut them up on the kitchen table at home to work out how they'd been built and how many layers of uh, composite were in them and where the typically 
there was more composite and less composite and maybe how they got about designing it. And I got to a point where I'd understood enough. I drew a sketch and I sent it out to some of the people that I'd got the frames from and a couple of others and said, can you make it? And one of them came back and said, yes, we'll make it if we can have access to the moulds as well. And I said, yes. And six weeks later, I got a bike frame back. Um, I then built up a bike and raced that in the Abu Dhabi Half Ironman. At that point, I didn't have a company, didn't have a brand. I just had a bike with a name down the side. And the name happened to come from four friends that had thought, yeah, this seems like a good idea. Um, and away we went. Six weeks later, a, a gentleman by the name of Mark Buckingham, who's the domestique for the Brownlee brothers, as was, uh, contacts me from Yokohama where he was doing the ITU event with the Brownlee brothers and said, do you sponsor athletes? And he'd done that off the back of me opening a Twitter account with a dassy handle that just said British made bikes, nothing more. So he was the first tweet <laughs> um, to an unknown brand. And uh, I said, I don't know. So I met him at Leicester Forest Services a week later and handed over the only bike I had in the world. He disappeared off to Loughborough University with um, his coaches and anything else. Um, and a fortnight later, he rings me back up and says, can I keep it? It's brilliant. I went, but it's the only one I've got. He said, well, no, I, I, I think it's great. And three weeks after that, he won the ITU Polymass race in Spain and was all over the back of the Times magazine. <laughs> It was like, oh, right, okay, well, maybe we better do something. And, and Dassey was basically born out of that story. The actual brand name, Dassey, comes from Dave, Adam, Stuart, Stuart, Innovation, because they were the four founders, and we thought it sounded a bit Germanic if we just called it Das, so we stuck an eye on the end. And little did we know that the innovation piece was probably going to pay quite a big part in our um, story. When we started, I have to hand on heart say... Um, we didn't truly understand, apart from the, the headline news, it will reduce weight, what else graphene was truly going to do for us. And it's turned out, through collaboration with a couple of key customers, that it has the potential and, uh, to deliver quite a lot, but it's also already delivered quite a lot to us. So it reduced the overall weight of the bikes by 20%. But then on top of that, we discovered through one of our customers and by accident it has to be said that it has huge vibration dampening properties when built into a bike frame and, and we found that vibration was reduced by 65 percent between a standard carbon frame and one that had graphene in it the, the third is actually being able to spray a bike with graphene because it's hydrophobic so not a great deal sticks to it so if you could imagine taking a house brick and sticking it in a wind tunnel and spraying that house brick with graphene, it would instantly be more aerodynamic. And then the final piece is its conductivity. Because graphene is such a conductor, it raises the question for me as to how I can connect what is a humble product such as a bicycle through to the cloud Artificial, intel artificial intelligence and big data. And you can do that because you can use the composite as a conductor to transmit data. And that is something that DASI has just very recently applied for patents in and um, a UK grant for. So we're very much on the page of creating the world's first intelligent bike without actually putting cables in it. The Cycling Podcast is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport, fueled by science. So this is where I, I think I, I get really, really interested. Imagine a bike with no cables, just transmitting all kinds of data just wirelessly to the cloud. Yeah, I was thinking about this on the way out, actually, when um, I was riding my TT bike. I don't ride it that often, so I don't think to, to charge the DI2. And just before I got here, the DI2 stopped working. 
<laughs> and I've been listening to this clip from Dassey and I just thought, oh, you know, if I had this cableless, data-proof bike where I knew everything, and I, actually my power meter battery was running low as well. So all of these things I'd have found out in advance and I wouldn't have run out of power and I wouldn't have run out of battery and be riding home in one gear. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it can really, it could really change things in the future. I think it will be quite a long time until we see this. Um, but for sure, it will happen. What about, I mean, I, I was thinking about the sort of implications for TV viewing because obviously Velon have come along and they've, they've tried to make the TV, we, you know, we're always trying to think how to capture a bigger TV audience in a much more competitive landscape. You know, how, to, how do you make the viewing experience of cycling, which is a long form sport, how do you make it more interesting? And one of the answers has always been, more data, access to you know access to more data on the TV screens, and Velon have tried this with things like heart rate and, and power data and stuff like that. But you look at other sports like Formula One, for instance, where there's just tons of data all the time, probably too much. But imagine you know for, for TV viewing, if you're getting all this extra data, surely you know I mean, make things more interesting, and it's, surely it make things more interesting for the viewer. What do you think? Yeah, I think oh, I think you can have data overload. I think it's it can make it more interesting for the viewers and it could also change the sport actually because it's not just the viewers who can see it, it's the sports directors and, and then the riders can feed that information they can feed that information to the riders through the radios and then perhaps you can um, not manipulate the data, but kind of, uh, you can see it coming in in real time and you can say, right, you know, Nibali's heart rate's at 189, he's going to blow, you need to attack in, you know, X kilometres. So it could it could change things in a lot of ways. Um, I think that the Velon data is really, really interesting as a viewer, but um, I don't know how much more data we actually need. Oh, I don't know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong. I guess we'll see. Well, I was under the impression that this was just some kind of future gazing from Stuart, but that's not the case. We're, we're at the point now. We're at a, a point of where technology is going to accelerate in this particular field. So about nine months ago, I did an interview with BBC Click and I demonstrated in that interview, live on TV, the innovation of a graphene sensor so in this particular case, it was a, basically a pressure sensor transmitting data right the way through the frame from the sensor up to um, a, a, a transmitter that was just on the handlebar and up into the cloud. And associates at Dimension Data at the time helped process that information live so that we could make sense of what it is. And what DASI is currently well, we're beyond design uh, and we're beyond prototype. We're somewhere pre-production, if you like, is we're going to have a bike with, I think at the moment it's 22 different sensors on it. And those sensors are physically printed in graphene into the composite. And then we utilize a channel of graphene that doesn't compromise the structural integrity of the composite to move the conducted signals, if you like, to a point where they can be transmitted up to the cloud. So we have things like pressure, temperature, um, humidity, twist, pitch, yaw, acceleration, deceleration. Uh, the most complicated one is um, drag coefficient, which is quite important because if you're cycling along and you're in a race and you want to know how efficiently you're moving, really you've only got a measure of drag that would actually derive that so by moving dynamically your position on the bike in line with when it says yes you're in the most optimum position that you can be right now based purely on drag then you've got a mechanism of moving that bike wherever you are in the most efficient manner well, this goes back to what you were just saying there, Lizzie, you know, about um, not just the data for the TV audience, for sports directors, for the riders themselves. You know, imagine getting real-time data about your, your drag and being able to, to optimise your body position to reduce it. I mean, you, 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 you're you someone who loves a TT. I mean, surely that floats your boat. I think that's incredible, and I think that is really where you see... 
um, this kind of smart bike, or you could potentially see this smart bike t- technology being used in day-to-day athletes and the way that they ride. So, you know, CDA is something that the athletes spend hours and hours and hours hundreds of hours trying to optimize they spend so much money and time in the wind tunnel they spend time doing track testing and you get this absolute optimized cda but then when you're in a race you have absolutely no way of knowing whether you are hitting that cda when you say cda what's what does that stand for uh so your coefficient of drag right um so basically how well how aero you are how fast you are cutting through the wind um and so so if you can get the, the, the most optimized CDA, then you're going to be faster for that given speed and given power over a certain distance. Um, if that's something that, that you can see on your Garmin, you can go, oh yeah, my CDA is a bit high, I need to really tuck my head in, or I need to shrug my shoulders up, or whatever, then that can really optimize time trialing in the moment, and you know we'll see times fall in, in time trials and, and speeds go up. Imagine if you had that as well and another team didn't. You know, the advantage would be incredible, right? Yeah, I think that's the kind of thing that you see in Team Ineos first and then uh, trickles down to those with with less money and uh, women cycling then eventually. (laughs) Okay, here's another vision of the future. And then if you could move forward (laughs) even more, if you've got enough data and you can make it dynamic such that the information is processed in the cloud and passed straight back down to the athlete, you can begin to go, in two miles you are going to run out of energy. Therefore, eat something now or drink now or you are four minutes behind the pace. If you wish to get back on the pace, you need to increase your your wattage output by two watts um, and you've got the capacity to do that because at the moment we think you're fueled. Nothing like that exists today, but there is a parallel to F1 if you like, in the way that they measure everything and they send it back to the driver. And between the driver and all the measurements, they make intelligent decisions about what to do, change tyres, increase speed, oh no, back off, we're going to run out of fuel, humidity is going up, better change the wind positions. You know, all of those kind of things can be done dynamically, but it's never been done on a bike. So what do you, what do you make of that? You know, the, the I mean, I, I, a lot of that is it's very much future gazing, but the kind of biofeedback that you could potentially get as well, you know, with all this, all the potential wearable tech and the smart bike. I feel like the real-time CDA is potentially a much, much bigger thing than patch, potentially kind of real-time biofeedback. Personally, I know my body so well and I've spent so many hours on the bike that I know when I need to eat. And perhaps it's only when you're doing something really out of your comfort zone, like my big ride yesterday where I was seven hours in and it's it's not really, you know, the kind of thing I do. So then I'm like, oh God, I'm about to bonk here. But um, I know when I need to eat and I kind of have a pretty good schedule. So yeah, maybe that's something that could be important in the future, but I don't really see it being kind of world changing like something like a, a real time CDA could be I mean there is a danger with all that stuff of making the sport so cold and calculated that you actually take you know you look at a rider that captures the you know people's attention like Alaphilippe for instance with that you know that, that panache you know the more everything becomes understood and controlled again you know potentially the, the less interesting the, the sport is yeah I think you you always you have to remember that there's always going to be a feel for these things you know you can't calculate everything in sport there are so many variables and um yeah you have to have a feel for when to attack and you know it, the the rule book might say or this kind of bio predictable rule book might say okay you need to have a gel at 12:23 and 13 seconds but what if you want to attack at 12:23 and 10 seconds so you need to kind of take these variables into account and it's always going to be more than just kind of do x and then do y but but i think there's definitely um definitely a place for it uh, perhaps in in more controlled environments like triathlon and ironman where you know you're going to be on the bike for x hours and you've got to ride 100 miles and you're riding at a steady constant rate um there could be a role f- role for these things in the future and again i think it is something that we will see brought in um but it will take a long time i want to go back to the the the, the data and obviously we, we mentioned it earlier on but obviously more data available to the rider means more data potentially available to the tv audience 
I asked Stuart about current attempts to provide data to viewers and what might be possible further down the line. At the moment, the Velon stuff, if you like, as, as an example, and Dimension Data have done something similar, is a bolt-on. So it's basically a device in a box that is somewhere put either on the cyclist or on the bike or, or whatever, but it's limited. It's, it's kind of like a GPRS signal, so where am I on the planet? Am I at altitude? Am I at sea level? What's the temperature? You know, all of those kind of things, all of which are quite important. And then you get a few standard, um, if you like, measurements that are coming from the athlete, like his heart rate and his and his wattage. Um, and all of those things, or those small things, are meant to make the sport a little bit more interactive for the viewing public because they can go, oh, wow, look at that. He's pushing 5,000 watts and his heart's about to come out of his chest. Wow, that's exciting. I wonder what Chris Froome's doing. That's lovely. But <clears throat> it's only a tiny amount of measurements. You don't actually know, uh, based on the power, how much the frame is deforming. You don't know how much um, temperature is having an impact on that athlete. All of those other things that are happening uh, would be of interest. That's, for me not just from a racing perspective, but from a training perspective is where I'm trying to get to. If I can produce the world's first intelligent bike that will enable you to train better without compromising the structural integrity of that bike and without adding huge amounts of weight, then that is a game changer. That's something very innovative that nobody's been able to get at. So we spoke about um, the time, the team time trial at the 2017 Tirreno Adriatico when Team Sky had that big crash after three riders had their wheels fail at the same time. We spoke about this earlier, but I asked Stuart about the possibility of integrated sensors telling you how close a component is to failing. So you could put strain gauges, accelerometers, etc., into the handlebars. Um, one of the other developments we've got is an intelligent handlebar um, at the moment, which has some of those sensors built into it. Now, originally, it was for the benefit of the rider to try and improve their performance. But in the example you've just given, it would be beneficial to the engineers to understand in the real world what does a professional cyclist actually put through his handlebars, as an example, um, in terms of pressure, what forces are being deployed. Because you could actually be... Um, as an engineer, over-designing the composite, if it's a composite cockpit, um, and you wouldn't know. So, And you're not going to know sometimes by doing um, tests that try to replicate the real world, because as we just discussed, the real world is very different. You're either at altitude or you're at sea level. You, the ambient temperature is higher or lower or you know all these variables are constantly changing and they all may have an impact on the performance of that product well if you could measure it in real time or as bristol university have done utilized um uh, dyes within a composite so essentially what happens is when it starts to get to a point of failure it releases a dye and the color of the composite changes so you might put a yellow dye in there for argument's sake. And if it fails, it will glow yellow. That's quite important. It would be even better if you could physically measure it rather than it just being, I've reached a peak, which is all the dye's doing. So it all sounds very exciting. Um, the last thing I asked Stuart was if or when graphene would become ubiquitous in cycling. Well, like everything, you, you can't have um, a one-handed man clapping in the forest and expecting to achieve greatness in isolation. And essentially, as much as graphene and the way we're thinking about it and the way we're utilising it is unique, um, everybody in the cycling world would have to be um, a little bit more research and innovation oriented towards the benefits of graphene. So at the moment, they aren't. And that's probably because they get they believe that they're getting their benefits out of a traditional composite. So yes, we've seen the rise in graphene tires, which is is wonderful. But there isn't a single graphene bike in the tour yet. 
there isn't anything near that level of technology. We're still operating on various forms of industry standard fibers. And it's not really um, on most people's innovation agenda because they're looking at it from a different commercial standpoint. They're, they're looking at it from a, how cheap can I make this frame in China? And what's my margin? They're not looking at it from how can I create a differentiator? And unfortunately for us to compete with those people that are making in China, we need to differentiate. And it's back to the F1 analogy. <clears throat> You're only ever going to have a few people as it stands in the early adopter sort of reign, um, taking on and utilizing any form of leading edge material science or technology um, until it gets to the point where um, the price point for it drops and it can become more readily available to um, a, a different commercial sort of price point. And at the moment, there's no need for some of the big boys to be even thinking about why should they make their frame 20% lighter or why should they put conductive pathways in it, etc. Because they don't need to do that in order to sell bikes. So Lizzie, you've heard all that. Are you sold? I think I am. <laughs> yeah, um, I think I would quite like a graphene bike. I quite like having the next new thing. Um, I think it's exciting. I think there's huge potential. You know, he was talking about um, it's hydrophobic as well, and it, it, it kind of stops dirt picking up. Can you imagine if you had a, a, a dirt-proof bike? like Basically like a self-cleaning oven, but a self-cleaning bike. Can you imagine that? What aspects of like a potential graphene cycling future interest you the most then, other than the self-cleaning bike? For me, the weight, I think, is really interesting. Um, perhaps you can reduce weight and increase stick stiffness in the wheels because, you know, rotating weight is something that, or a higher rotating weight means that your acceleration is reduced. So if you can reduce that rotating weight and increase that stiffness. Um, also what he said was really interesting about how um, it dampens the vibrations as well. So I really like my bike to be really, really stiff and I like to kind of feel the road. But when you go over those potholes that hopefully won't exist in the future because we'll have graphene roads, um, then you know, you've, it doesn't create suspension, but it, it, it omits this, it omits this, um, yeah, road vibration and maybe we can reduce saddle sores. Who knows what the possibilities can be? They're endless. Um, I think I think graphene's great. I think, why not? We always need to be looking to the future. We all need, always need to be pushing the boundaries. And um, I do think this is the next big thing and it's coming and it's coming, but it's going to take time. Okay, well, I did start this episode by showing you Adrian's business card. Can you remind me what that says? The International Space Elevator Consortium. So I couldn't leave you hanging. I know it's not about cycling, but when someone talks about building a space elevator, you really do need to listen. So here's Adrian Nixon again. There are two ways of getting into space. At the moment, rockets. So you talk to Elon Musk and he'll sit you on top of one of his rockets and then it gets hot and dangerous and noisy and eventually you're in space. Um, and that creates a lot of pollution as well. Um, there is another way though, because um, this has been around for about 100 years. First of all, you need rockets to get stuff up into space. But if you create a geostationary satellite, from that satellite, if you take a cable and drop it all the way down to the ground, then you've got a connection between space and the Earth, and you can then just grab hold of this cable and climb up like Jack and the Beanstalk, and then you're in space. Yeah? Attach an elevator to it, and it'll crawl up, and you've got a, a lift to the stars. That's roughly what a space elevator is. Now, it sounds like science fiction, and until recently, you could argue, yes, it has been. But NASA, uh, at the turn of the century, back in 2000, uh, wanted to sort of nail this once and for all because they'd heard a lot about it and it'd been niggling away in the background for a number of years. They gave one of their rocket scientists, a guy called Bradley Edwards, um, a couple of million dollars and said, go away, do a feasibility study. Is this real or is it science fiction? He came back a couple of years later and said... Well, do you know what? It's actually quite doable. He said, we've broken it down into all bits, so all the stuff that requires putting a satellite in orbit, that's doable with today's technology. We can have a space station up there. We've got one. There's half a million kilograms of stuff in space already at the ISS, International Space Station. So that's all doable. The base station where you connect everything, that's all doable with today's technology. And uh, oil and gas industry have got all that sorted. The main thing is the cable which connects the a thing in space to the ground 
that was a stumbling point. It needs to be made of a material that is incredibly strong, yet incredibly light. And at the time, very few materials fit that bill. The problem is, you imagine you're standing at the top of an, of an infinitely high cliff and you've got this big cable in your hand. It doesn't matter how strong it is. As you pay it out, the stuff that dangles over the edge has weight and eventually it pulls on itself and the amount of weight it makes it snap under its own load. And that's the uh, materials problem. Now, it turns out that graphene is, uh, well, the material that needs to um, uh, have a certain amount of strength. The strength is measured in something called gigapascals. And steel is um, probably, I'm just trying to remember, about 400, 500 megapascals uh, before it breaks. And this is tensile strength. Uh, graphene has 130 gigapascals before it will break. And a space elevator needs something that's about 60 gigapascals strong. So this is way, way capable enough of doing it. The only problem is... You need to make graphene in long, continuous lengths. So all the stuff that James and I and you've been talking about today, all that wonderful stuff you've heard about, is all to do with graphene powders. This is graphene that's mashed up into little bits. That's where the commercial activity is at the minute. And there's another side of graphene, which is to make it continuously in large-scale sheets on scales of rug and carpets and things. That can't be done at the moment. But a few years ago, I put together um, a process for doing just that. And over the last few years, I've been working on that. And that's got me to the attention of a number of people. It's part of the reason I'm working here. Um, and uh, to cut a long story short, there's a, an organization called the International Space Elevator Consortium based in California. It's a lot of rocket scientists and uh, people who sort of hold the faith for creating a space elevator. And um, at the beginning of this year, they invited me to join their board. So I'm now part of the International Space Elevator Consortium, and I'm specialising the materials for the tether. So there you go, Lizzie. A material that could possibly link bike frames to a lift to the stars. My head is spinning, so I'm going to say goodbye. Thank you very much. Um, we're back next month, and you've been working on next month's episode. What can you tell us about it? Well, we are looking at the new Hope Lotus bike frame, the track bike frame. Um, indoor cycling, Daniel. Yeah, indoor cycling. <laughs> um, but it's really interesting. And actually, this, this to talk about graphene really got me thinking about that. And uh, it's a radical new design. And um, they had some problems with it, actually, try, trying to kind of get the design the way they wanted it, but with the strength and, um, you know, with the traditional materials like carbon fibre, so perhaps they should look to using graphene in the future. And we'll be looking at it and kind of seeing, is it as good as it looks? And uh, comparing it to the other things out there. With the run-up to the Olympics, you know, people are going to be talking about that bike. And, and it's great, actually, as well. The, you know, the, the, that bike has such a history going back to riders like, you know, the original one with, with Chris Boardman and that. So that's very interesting. So that's next month. Until then, thank you very much, Lizzie. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. This episode of Service Course by The Cycling Podcast was produced by me, Tom Wally. Our theme tune is Beyond the Black Veil by John Dix. Additional music in this episode by Cody Butler, Xperia, August Wilhelmson, From Now On, Emil Axelson, Nikki Dowling, Mockers, By Lotus and Silver Maple. All music and effects courtesy of Epidemic Sound. Thanks to Richard, Lionel and all at the Cycling Podcast. And Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year from me and Lizzie. We'll see you in 2020.